Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. This is a follow-up video to the IBM 5170, specifically about all the problems that the stock IBM BIOS has with those error codes like 601, 162, and specifically the inability of this BIOS to work with any modern IDE hard drives or compact flash or SD cards. It will always just freeze. If you haven't seen my series where I restore this machine and go over those issues in great depth because it really, really frustrated me, I recommend you go watch that first before you watch this video. Anyhow, without further ado, let's get right to it. As I mentioned in the intro, the BIOS on this computer and the IBM 5162, which is the XT looking counterpart to this machine, it's also a 286, they both have tons of issues when you're trying to use more modern hardware in them. The biggest roadblock isn't necessarily those error codes, which you may or may not get, depending on what components you have on here. The biggest issue is trying to use a modern IDE hard drive with the original BIOS, it just results in problems. If you read the forums on VCF or minus zero degrees.net, a lot of the fixes that everyone talk about is just replacing the original BIOS with another more modern 286 BIOS, which totally does work on this machine, and that will fix your issues. That's exactly what I did, I think in part two or maybe part three of the video series, but I wanna undo that. I'd like this computer to have the original IBM BIOS again. I want to bring some more of the purity back to this machine. And if possible, I want to try to use the original IBM floppy controller card, which I also took out in the series. So to try to tackle these particular issues, I reached out to viewer Stuart, and yes, that's the same guy who has sent in Apple II Pluses and all sorts of other amazing machines to the basement. And we talked about the particular problems with this BIOS and if there was a way to actually fix them. Well, turns out there is a way. And due to the amazing hard work put in by Stuart, and I helped by doing testing and whatever on my machine, we actually came up with a solution and completely fixed all of the issues, at least all the issues that I was having with this BIOS. So I'm going to talk now about the technical fixes that we did to the BIOS to fix those issues. But if you don't want to hear about all that, you can just go in the description below. There's actually a link to download the BIOS yourself with some instructions, and then you can fix your IBM 5170 as well. So let's get to talking about the BIOS hacking that we did to fix IBM's problems. In the video series, I showed this picture, which I found on minus zero degrees.net, and someone had disassembled part of the IBM BIOS, and they talk about why the 601 error is appearing. And it seems to be something to do with it looking for something unique about this original controller here. And when it doesn't find it, you get the 601 error. And oddly enough, I had this card in the computer, and in the video, I was still getting the 601 error. So who knows what's going on there? But in this code here, it talks about that there's a problem, but unfortunately, it didn't talk about what the solution is. So there's an amazing project here called the IBM PC BIOS source code reconstruction, which I guess what's happened here is someone has reconstructed the actual source code in assembly for all of these IBM BIOSes. I don't think this was a leak or anything like that, but this is the actual code that's taken from these files and turned back into code which you can assemble yourself with, say, Microsoft Assembler. And right here is the IBM PC AT Type 3 BIOS. If we click that, it actually downloads the code. So talking through these errors with Stuart, he took that source code from that website and he started analyzing what might be going on. And he wrote up a little blurb for each of these errors for me to kind of explain what was going on. And then he talks about what the fix is. So he says here for the 601 error, that basically the BIOS is looking for a specific drive controller and when it doesn't find it, it posts that 601 error. And in the file test two, which is right here, now this is from that project, this is the actual source code that's part of that testing routine. 
he identified that it's line 1322 where the 601 error is coming from. That test routine is actually reading a register from the drive controller. And remember the IDE card or whatever you have in there is emulating this original card. So it's trying to do some kind of diagnostic. Well, because you might be getting a 601 error on your machine or it might come up when you switch controllers, what we decided to do is literally just jump past that test entirely. So that floppy drive test will never result in an actual 601 error. This is that section of code right here. So check for multiple data rate capability. And there's various tests here. And whoever created this project actually commented all of this code, which is extra amazing. So what Stuart came up with for the fix is to just look at the code that's looking for that original IBM code and where it conditionally jumps to say, yep, I found that original IBM code. It basically just always jumps. So instead of a conditional jump, JZ, J underscore OK, it goes to JMP short J underscore OK. And that's regardless of the type of card found. So essentially with this fix in place, no matter what you actually have in the machine, I think it's somewhere around here, it will always work and it will never give that error. Now, I think if you have no card in the computer, you might still get an error. But if you have a card that is working, but you were getting a 601 with this fix, you won't. All right, for the next problem, the 162 error, this is what Stuart wrote. He says that basically the BIOS is trying to retrieve some settings from the NVRAM, the non-volatile RAM that's in the clock chip about the floppy drive settings. Now, when I was first testing this on my original video, when I would use G setup, even though I had the drives configured correctly, I'd always get that 162 error. And what Stuart says is it seems to be looking at what's set in the BIOS and VRAM compared to what it's actually detecting when it's scanning the floppy drives. And if it doesn't match, you're gonna get that 162 error. And it seemed like nothing I could do except for removing the 1.44 meg drive would make that error go away. It seemed to be somehow related to G setup, not setting up something in the BIOS. I'm not exactly sure. But the weird thing is, is the computer, even with that error, would always work. I never actually had a problem with the floppy drives. Everything worked perfectly. So that error, it's just like superfluous. It's not helpful in any way. So just like with the 601 error, the fix was basically just to change a conditional jump to a permanent jump. And that's right here, JNZ F1, F15D. And if we go back to the code here, I think it's in here, something to do with the disk setup. And we basically altered it to just always jump like it was happy with the drive configuration. It seems to have no ill effect whatsoever because it was always working anyways and just getting rid of that error just made the system work and it wouldn't make you push F1 to boot up. And here he's saying that yeah, it was trying to go to this config bad call and that's what propped, it, propped up that error on the screen. There's a bunch of other testing that goes on. We didn't touch any of that. So you could still see uh, one of those 162 errors or 163, there's a couple different ones for other types of mismatches, but definitely the floppy drive one went away. And I'll just preface this by saying, as we worked on this, I was testing all of these fixes one by one as we were figuring them out and the 162 error that I was stuck with on the machine with the original BIOS went away as soon as we applied this fix. Okay, next problem is the hard drive freezing, the one that really stops you from using this computer with a modern controller. Even if you get rid of the 601 error and the 162 error, the hard drive freezing is a showstopper. The odd thing is, and I didn't talk about this in the series, it's actually a way around that error. So if you're using the original BIOS, you don't have the 601 error, you don't have the 162, and you don't want to run a modified BIOS at all, you can still use IDE. Now, one such way is with a card like this, an XD IDE card. This has a BIOS on it that replaces the hard drive routines from the stock BIOS and actually allows you to successfully work with a compact flash card or hard drive, whatever, plugged into this card. But you don't actually need one of these in your 5170 because you know you can use a standard 16-bit IDE card like I'm doing now, and you don't need to have an IDE interface on an 8-bit card like you do for an XT. You really only need the ROM. This little board here is a Monotech ROM board, I guess, 
Uh, you can buy these from Monotech in New Zealand. Um, I had this one made up, this PCB made up. What this has on it is the XTE IDE ROM on it. That's it. It's a little ISA card. You pop it in the computer and this will show you that option ROM at boot. I configured this to utilize that 16-bit ISA IDE card that's in that machine, but replace the hard drive routines. And this actually lets you use any size hard drive you want. You can use a 32 gig hard drive, like the card I have in there now, fully works. But this also replaces the stock BIOS hard drive routines so that the freezing problem also doesn't happen. So that is one workaround. And these are inexpensive, but I kind of feel like that's cheating a little bit. It's modern code on the 5170. I'm trying to keep it original. I'm trying to keep it pure. So I wanted to fix the actual problem with the stock BIOS that creates that freezing. So in Stuart's write-up, he talks about the fact that anything over 1K freezes up. And if we go over to this assembly code, this is from that disassembled or reconstructed firmware image. This talks about all the various interrupt routines, basically, that the BIOS gives DOS or any program that's running to access the hard drive. And this is translating between these calls and the actual command set that this controller or IDE uses to talk to the disk drive. And the specific one that was having problems is this one right here is 2H, read the desired sectors into memory. Oddly enough, the right one works perfectly because I was able to format the hard drive, copy a bunch of files onto it from a floppy disk, it was all working. But as soon as you tried to read it back, it would freeze. So it's really this O2 routine that is the problem. Looking at the relevant section of code here for the disk reading, basically there's not a lot going on here, but what it does is it issues the command for reading, the read command, and then it jumps to this command I stuff. So there's a lot of like jumping around going on in this code. Let's kind of go down to that section. Here it is, repeatedly input data till the N sector returns zero. So it keeps reading the sectors in until it doesn't get any more back. On old machines like this, a sector size is 512 bytes. And actually that stuck around for a really long time with uh, Windows and, and PCs as a, as a, in general. But yeah, it's 512 bytes. So one read works fine. Two reads seems to work fine, but three reads or more, that's when it fails out. And there's a lot of stuff going on here, but it's talking about you know initializing the controller card, waiting for interrupts, jumping around to do that. There's some ECC error correcting stuff going on, things like that. Now, what's interesting is we knew that it was having a problem in this section, but we didn't know exactly where in this section it was happening. So Stuart had a really great idea to basically use my postcard, which is that little card with the, uh, the LED screen on, the little two digit display that normally shows initial boot diagnostics. Well, once the computer's booted up, that thing doesn't do anything anymore, but you just write to a particular port in memory and that little LED screen will display a number. So he just wrote in this code here, uh, these out statements with different codes, like 50, up here it wrote 50, here it wrote 51, here it wrote 52, you know, stuff like that. So we could kind of see where it was crapping out. Now I would do a read of a smaller file and it would successfully read and it would show 55 on there, which was the final code he programmed into here. But whenever I tried to read something that was gonna fail, it was over 1,023 bytes, I would get 52. And that allowed us to zero in on this section right here. It was this call wait where it says, wait for data request interrupt and this timeout. This was the problem area. So going back to his write-up, he talks about this problem. He says, for large files, it has to be read in chunks, making multiple requests to the hard drive. Whenever the hard drive completes the request, it tells the BIOS it's done by sending an interrupt. Normally, the BIOS requests the data, and that's what we were looking at in that disk.asm, and gets ready at line 977 for a wait to wait for that interrupt to come in. When you look at the code, what goes on is it sits there waiting for the interrupt to come in, and when it doesn't come in, it just says, not ready. Like it basically is like, oh, the drive is dead or whatever, and it gives you that error. 
So this code here works perfectly for old hard drives, no problems at all. They're slow, it sends a request to read some data, then the BIOS sits there waiting for the interrupt to come in, it gets the interrupt, it reads the sector back. No issues at all. Well, it turns out the problem, and this is what Stuart writes here, is that new hard drives are too quick. And they basically send back that interrupt to say, I'm ready with the data before the BIOS is even looking for the interrupt. And when it starts to look for it, it just sits there. And of course the interrupt never comes in because it's already been sent, but the BIOS missed it. Well, Stuart talks about the fix here. It's a little bit more complicated than those other ones where we simply like jumped over that error code. He had to change it a little bit about the way it actually is listening for the interrupt so that it would catch the much faster interrupt. Well, Stuart's fix for this problem was different than those other 601 errors and stuff like that where you just jump over the problem. This actually required a little bit more thought. Now he talks about the fact that the wait function, waiting for the interrupt, the issue with that is if we just bypass that, it could be that it was trying to read the data and it wasn't ready and you could have stability issues. So we actually switched the function over to the not busy function, which is another command that the controller supports where you're asking it, hey, are you done? Are you just sitting there idle? Yes or no? So if the hard drive is busy doing something, it's, it's basically gonna return a busy signal. So this waits for the hard drive controller to not be busy. Well, he talks about that this was a great replacement for this wait functionality because it should still allow some error checking, but instead of it stalling out with the fast hard drives, it should actually work. Okay, let's talk about some of the bonus stuff as well that I asked him to change in the BIOS to make it a little more useful. On the original BIOS, the largest hard drive type was what, like 100 and something megabytes? Not really big enough. Old BIOSes that don't support like the new LBA addressing, a logical block addressing that allows for really big hard drives, the maximum hard drive size is 504 megabytes format. It's like 512 megs, but when you format it, it's less. The AMI BIOS and the Quadtel BIOS that works on the 5170 allows you to do a custom type where you get uh, 1,023 cylinders, you get 63 sectors per track and you get 16 heads and that gives you the 512 megabytes or 504 megabytes, 5, 503, 504, something like that. Now there's no way to do that easily on the 5170, right? There's no custom type support. So I asked Stuart just to modify the actual BIOS to put in one of the types that gives that much um, capacity. So he did that and he says it's not really a fix but he just altered the table and actually um, we talked about this and we changed it. So first he edited the type one hard drive, which is, I don't know, however big that was to make it the maximum size, but he actually changed it to the type 24 hard drive, which has no settings. It was all blanked out anyways. And that allows you to set that type and then you get a 504 meg hard drive capability when you use these larger drives. So that was pretty simple. There's an org s.asm, that's the tables. So we just added the cylinders 1023, 16 heads, uh, no pre-comp, no landing zone. We don't need that stuff for uh, modern hard drives and 63 sectors per track. This is the maximum possible size that the original BIOS can support unless you're using something like the XT IDE. So if you want more space, you gotta use this. There's no fix for that. Okay, one more little piece of bonus content that we've come up and modified on the original IBM BIOS. Anytime you change BIOS code, for instance, say you hex edit the code, you have to recalculate the checksum and put that down at the very end of the file. Otherwise, the BIOS won't work. So it was getting kind of annoying because we kept modifying the BIOS by you know, trying to figure out these fixes and stuff. And every time we had to recalculate the checksum, otherwise when I flash that onto chips, put it in the computer, it wouldn't boot at all. It just sit there uh, with a postcode of zero, zero and it would hang. So I asked Stuart to go look at the code in the BIOS that actually calculates a checksum and hangs if it doesn't match. I mean, it's doing that for good reason. Say your ROM chip is bad. You don't wanna like boot a bad ROM chip and you know cause crashing, right? So it basically does that check to ensure that it's valid, like the, the chip is valid, otherwise it hangs. Well, I asked him to disable that and he did. So it's in the test one assembly file. And basically there's a halt instruction where it says if the checksum doesn't match, halt, well, we just switch that to no, a no-op, a no-operation, which means it goes right past it.
So with that, those are all the changes that are required to the BIOS to fix all of these issues. And here it is in uh, his write-up, which like as I said, will be included with the file. Now, what I've done is I asked him to do a couple things. You could recompile this entire BIOS yourself using Microsoft Assembler. And in this file, he describes how to do that. And actually, he was recompiling this or reassembling, I'm sorry, the correct terminology is assembling. He was assembling the file from that assembly code and creating a bin file for me. And we had to do that because while hex editing works, if you're just changing a jump to a, a conditional jump to a jump, we were adding like those instructions to uh, write those postcodes to the postcard. That was changing the code quite dramatically. That is something you actually need to do with an assembler. And that's what we were doing. So it's really cool that this project here has really created code that you can actually reassemble into a new bin file. It actually works. So that's why in Stuart's write-up, he actually talks about the line numbers and exactly what instructions he changes. So if you wanna go and reassemble the BIOS from scratch yourself using these fixes, you can go and edit the code and do it yourself and it will work. But on the other hand, there may be people who just wanna hex edit the ROMs that they have. Like you could stick your original IBM ROM chip, and here is one, this is a type two, but if you have the type three one, load that into your computer, into a hex editor, and you can hex edit these files using this instruction, create new chips uh, using some EEPROMs, put those in your computer, and these fixes will be in there. Because the 286 is a 16-bit machine, it uses two 8-bit ROM chips, which is like the originals right here. So it's U27 and U47, and these are all the fixes that you would wanna hex edit into the file to apply these changes. Now fix one, two, three, four, fix one, if we scroll back up here, is the 162 error. So all you need to do to get rid of that error is change a single byte in just this one file, and that's gone. Same for fix number two. There's actually no changes at all required for the other chip, it's just in this one. Now changing the freezing hard drive issue, which is fix number three, right? That was the, uh, the locking up over 1024. That requires a little bit more of a change. You're changing two bytes in that file and two bytes in that file, and that fixes that problem entirely. And then optionally for changing the hard drive type, you edit uh, these bytes here. Although actually I think this write-up is gonna modify the type one hard drive and not type 24. Uh, he went back and changed that after the fact, um, but it works this way as well. If you don't need the type one hard drive, then you can do these changes or just download the file that I'll have and the link in the description, and that will have type 24, or maybe it's 23. I don't remember which one it is. Uh, that will be changed. And then for the BIOS checksum, in order to not have to keep changing that, uh, recalculating that, you just change the single byte in U27, and that will disable that checksum capability of the BIOS. Down here, he talks about the development environments that he used to do all this compiling or reassembling of the code. But really, it was VirtualBox with Microsoft Assembler, well, the IBM version of Microsoft Assembler 2.0. This is a very useful utility here, ROM WAC. It allows you to split and combine the BIOS file. So say you use your EEPROM reader to read these two files. Well, you're gonna get a byte split file where this is like the odd bytes and this is the even. We'll use the ROM WAC utility to recombine that into a single file or split it back out again. So after you reassemble and create a new bin file, it's 64K in size, you need to use this utility to split it back out to two files so you can actually burn that back onto two different EEPROMs. And then as I mentioned, Stuart doesn't even have an IBM 5170 or any ancient PC uh, for that matter, not even any 286. So he used MAME, MAME version 0.207, which can actually emulate an IBM 5170. And it does it so accurately that when you run the stock BIOS and you try to use a hard drive image, it has the exact same freezing problem where it freezes up over with those large files. Isn't that funny? That MAME is so accurate in the hardware department that the fast hard drive image that it can load causes that freezing. 
So of course, I'll put these links in the description of the video, but they're also going to be available in the download. So finally, after a lot of talking, let's test out these patches. I have created two EEPROMs here that have the fully patched ROMs on them. Uh, these are the ones that are still type one for the larger hard drive. It does not have the type 24. Uh, I haven't made a new set of those, but um, like I said, that'll be fixed in the file that you download. But I'm gonna stick these in the computer here and let's see if this actually fixes all the problems. And again, I highly recommend this chip extractor. There's a link in the description to it for getting the chips out of this machine because it's a real pain. Um, there's just a lot of components that are very close. And with this, it's that simple to just get the chips out of there. <laughs> Even when you're really close to um, like this RAM card here, it makes it very hard. So you just, there's a wire in the way. You just go down here and pop the chip right out, just like that. All right, the chips are in, let's give this a test. Okay, power up. Here we go. Now, before I actually boot up off the SD card, I want to change the hard drive type to the 504 megabyte one because that is how this hard drive is actually partitioned. It may actually boot off of that weird type I have set right now, but I'm booting off the three and a half inch floppy drive here. Oh, and I'll stick in this disk here, which has G setup on it and we will take a look at those hard drive types. Inside G Setup, when we go to number four for the hard drive type now, when you actually scroll down to one, there it is, 528 megabytes. So what it's actually showing you here isn't just information it thinks is the type, it actually looks in the BIOS and there's a table. That's what we edited and that actually shows you what the current values are. So when you download that file off uh, the link in the description, just look for, I think, type 23 or 24, which will have the same hard drive information in it. So you won't have to guess at which one to pick. So I'm just gonna keep this as type one and I'm gonna hit escape and we're gonna hit four to reboot the machine. And I'm gonna take these disks out and we're gonna boot directly off the hard drive. Now I can tell you, by the way, even if you modified that table or you tried to use that other type and I tried to boot, I didn't show this, but it would just freeze at boot time because booting and loading command.com, that is larger than 1K. For whatever reason, typing a directory obviously was working because you saw me demonstrate that. I think what happens when you do DIR is it loads little tiny segments of sectors as it reads in the fat table. It doesn't do it as one big read. So no matter what kind of disk controller you have in there, it's gonna seek the floppy drives and it won't give you that 601 error and it won't give you that 162 error. And here it is, booting into DOS. And this isn't just a fake thing because if we go to like Planet X3, we can actually run a game and it will actually work. I'm gonna pick uh, AdLib even though I don't have speakers hooked up because we won't hear the, the music coming out of the beep speaker, which is kind of loud. But there it is, it's actually running. Now I have to give a caveat of this fix. I've only tested this BIOS on my actual computer. It did fix the freezing problem on MAME in the emulator, fixed it for me with this SD card adapter, but I haven't tested it with a whole bunch of different hard drives and stuff like that. And I haven't definitely not tested it with the MFM controller here with an original MFM hard drive. The ones that used to work perfectly even with the stock unpatched BIOS. So it's quite possible that it won't work with the MFM hard drive, but it, it should because IDE and MFM are using the exact same command set. So it should absolutely work. It's just that the IDE interface with this particular SD card is just too fast for that interrupt handling routine. And this card is not, but this supports that same testing we're doing with that not ready that this thing supports. So really it should work, but if you end up testing this out and you find a problem with it with regards to different hard drive compatibility, please let me know. It may be something that we can work on. So to really restore priority to this machine, I wanna put this controller back in it, at least for the floppy drive portion. I can disable the floppy controller on that card, that the IDE card that's in there. So it'll just be doing IDE to the SD card. And this big old original card can be working as the floppy controller. 
Now the problem is normally is the hard drive controller that's on here, the primary hard drive controller, it occupies the same exact base IO address of 140 as IDE. And that's because IDE was designed to be fully compatible with this, like as I explained. Luckily, IBM put jumpers on the card here that allow you to change the base IO of this to a different address. And I've gone ahead and I've set those jumpers. So it's sort of like a secondary hard drive controller now, as opposed to a primary. So I think with that set that way, this should coexist with the IDE card that's in there. And since I've disabled, I will disable the floppy controller on there, that means that this floppy controller can actually work. So let's give that a try. On this particular hard drive controller, there's a jumper right here. And when you set that jumper, it is labeled JP2, that disables the floppy controller on here. Okay, so this is how everything looks in this machine. It's a bit crazy how many cards I have in here. Sound Blaster, the original one with the CMS, a creative music system on here. This is the ATI EGA VGA Wonder card. I think it's VGA Wonder, which supports uh, monochrome CGA, EGA, and VGA. It has two outputs on the back. This is the three megabyte RAM expansion card. This is the Intel Ether Express, I think it's the 16, 10 megabit card, if I recall. Down here, it's a little hard to see, but this is the IDE cable that comes in that slot right there. This is the original IBM fixed disk controller card with the floppy connected to it. I have the original IBM serial card right here in the slot. And then the last slot, which is actually free, is nothing in it, and you're not gonna be able to see it because the cable's in the way. That is the uh, SD card adapter is taken up there. I could probably free up that slot if I needed to by mounting the SD card somewhere else, like in, you know, tie it here on the case. Um, but I'd like to be able to access it from the back of the machine for loading software more easily onto this thing. Okay, we're in uncharted territory here. Hopefully everything should work. Let's see what happens. Um, uh, okay, that's interesting. What just happened there is the machine didn't turn on. So the green power LED, watch what happens when I turn the power switch on. It comes on and then it just immediately shuts off. The only thing I just changed is I reinserted this IBM card here. Let me just pull this out of the slot. Okay, so it's just hovering above the slot right here. Let's see if the computer turns on now. Look at that, it turns on. So this card has a short on it now. Are you freaking kidding me? So after all that blowing up of capacitors on the serial card, it seems that this card has now died as well. And the weird thing is, in the videos the, 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 where I was restoring this machine, that card was working. I didn't have a problem with it. So I guess we gotta figure out what's going on here. Hopefully it's not one of the chips that's died. Okay, so I think we all know the drill, right? Set my multimeter to continuity, and we'll stick that right there. And I just have to look at these tantalums in here and look for the shorted one. That one's fine. That one is shorted right there. Now, while there is a short across this particular tantalum, that doesn't mean that that's the actual one that's shorted. So I need to go around here and I'll get a marker. I'll mark all the ones that show up as shorted. Let's just see about this one right here, for instance. So that one's shorted as well. And I will figure out which has the lowest resistance value on here, closer to zero, the closest to zero. And that's the one I'm gonna cut off. Okay, I found three tantalums on the rail that's shorted. This one, this one right here, and there's one over here on this far side, that one. Uh, this one here, it has the lowest reading of around 0 0.75 ohms. This one here is 0 0.9 something. And this one over here is like one point something ohms. So I am pretty sure that shorted tantalum is this one. I am gonna use these cutters here and I am just gonna snip that off right now. There's the offending part. I'm gonna to have to go look that up to see what value this even is. I don't recognize it says 226M and plus 15K or something. So who knows what that is, but let's see if that short circuit is resolved after clipping that part off. And it is, it is gone. That was the offending part. 
So I'm just gonna find a replacement part and stick it on here and hopefully we should be back in business. I know it's not pretty, but I didn't have a 22 microfarad tantalum. So I put an electrolytic in place there. That's a 50 volt and it's a Nichicon. And of course it's not axial either. So that'd be something I could fix in the future, but it's good enough for right now to get this thing tested. All right, here we go. Try number two. Hey, it stayed on. No smokes coming out of it like that time I had the tantalum in backwards. I made extra careful sure to make sure I had that a new electrolytic capa capacitor in the correct orientation and seems to be working. So I was counting up the memory. The question is, will the floppy drives work? I shouldn't see any errors and will it still boot off of the IDE controller with the SD card? Let's hope this actually works. Hey, it's, it's seeking. Oh, this is good sign, good sign. Come on. Okay, it's kind of hanging up here. That would imply that there's a conflict uh, between the hard drive controller, the one I just put in the IBM one, and the IDE card. So yeah, what's happening here exactly? Time to investigate a little further. Well, I'm really not sure what was going on. It turns out that I had the jumper set wrong to make this controller show up as a secondary hard drive controller. Definitely in the original configuration, it would be overlapping with the base IO of the IDE card that's installed in this machine right now. But looking up the documentation for this on minus zero degrees.net, setting the jumpers like this should set this card to secondary, but it's definitely not working. Maybe it responds to the secondary address, but it seems to somehow still conflict with the IDE card no matter what I do. And as long as this card is in the machine, I can't get the IDE card to boot at all. So I think I'm just gonna not use this card. I'll just go back to the IDE card for both the floppy and the hard drive. The fact that I don't need to use an XT IDE BIOS or an XT IDE card itself to get IDE working on this machine is a big win for me. I've had some good seat time in front of this machine with this fixed BIOS and I've had no issues whatsoever. No error codes, no instability, no freezing. Everything is just working really well. Running Check It, the speed I'm getting off of the SD card is about 1100K per second. Yeah, it's not great, but I think that's pretty much the limit of a six megahertz ISA bus and a six megahertz 286 processor. You can't expect the moon. But overall, this machine is working fantastically. I guess my only problem is I'm coming from a 12 megahertz 286 and one with zero weight states, and this thing being six megahertz, and I think it has one weight state, it's pretty slow. The old 286 was at least two times faster than this thing, and that means that some games and stuff that used to work perfectly on there are really a bit too slow to play on this. But I still like this machine in that it's kind of historically accurate, and at 1984 when this thing came out, it was cutting edge. This thing was fast. Well, fast compared to a regular XT. I'm really excited that the BIOS problems are fixed, and I hope that this benefits the community. Other people with this 5170 machine, I highly recommend you get someone to burn you an EEPROM so you can replace your stock BIOS with this one just to get away from those potential 601 and 162 errors, and then of course, have no problems with fast hard drives. So that's gonna be it for this video. Even though I wasn't able to get this disc controller working in this machine, I'm okay with that because at least it's running the original IBM BIOS. So when you turn this thing on, it looks like an original IBM 5170. And there's no XT IDE in here either, bringing a whole bunch of modern features to this thing. It basically will operate a lot like an original machine back in 1984. Except for the fact that there's no noisy MFM hard drive in here but that's besides the point. So if you enjoyed this video, I would definitely appreciate a thumbs up. Uh, there's gonna be links in the description to all that stuff I talked about in the technical fixes, uh, including a link to go download the bio so you can flash it yourself. I would love to hear feedback about if it works for you and if there are still outstanding issues with this BIOS that maybe we could address in a future follow-up. I have a second channel. If you haven't checked that out yet, I recommend you do. It's got some fun stuff posted up there. I even have a candy review that is coming soon. 
And a huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are gonna be scrolling up the side of the screen. If you wanna become a patron, you can. There's a link in the description below. We'll take you over to my Patreon page. And then all the other YouTube stuff, thumbs up, thumbs down, subscribe, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I guess that's gonna be it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.